The United Nations is calling it a profound setback for human rights, but the generals in charge say they are protecting democracy. Mass arrests follow mass protests in Myanmar as people push back against the military. Can they succeed where they failed in the past, or will the junta crush the uprising by force? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the movement to push back the coup in Myanmar. Following the coup that ousted Aung San Suu Kyi two weeks ago, several members of the international community, including U.S. President Joe Biden, declared the world is watching. Despite Internet shutdowns, scenes of resistance have made their way around the globe. Students, monks and factory workers banging pots and pans, waving signs and singing revolutionary songs. World powers decried the takeover. The United Nations has passed resolutions while the U.S has reimposed sanctions and frozen a billion dollars in government aid, but to little effect. In a televised address to the nation, the man now in charge of Myanmar made no mention of the coup or the demonstrations. Instead, General Min Ong Lain, taking a page from the military's old playbook, spoke of the need for discipline and unity. And shots have now been fired in some cities, indicating the military could be hardening its crackdown. But how far? Are they willing to go to rein in a new generation of protesters? Let's put that to Min Zhao Wu. He is the director of the Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security, working on the ongoing peace process in the country. And he joins us now from Yangon. Thank you so much for being with us. I mean, I can only imagine the frustration you feel having come so far toward bringing democracy to the country, only to see it fall this far back in such a short period of time. How hard? Will those protesters on the streets have to fight? And how much help from the outside will they need to turn things around again? Uh, Myanmar people have demonstrated uh, their DNA, which is the anti-dictatorship. So Myanmar people uh, uh, do not accept any type of dictatorship. And they try to uh, rebel against uh, the military coup, uh, that is something I think the military is also expected. And currently, uh, young generations are taking the streets, and the strategy is to shut down the government by shut down the businesses and shut down the government uh, mechanism. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, the potential for the success is still uh, remote and still uh, be. Uh, uh, looking for uh, uh, its outlook uh, in coming days. Uh, and the military is also uh, in a uh, quite sophisticated approach. Uh, instead of going on head-on confrontation with the protester, uh, the only confrontation we uh, saw is quite limited, only a few incidents. And the military, uh, except one incident, uh, refrained from using uh, uh, life rounds as well. And this is also uh, the challenges for other activists because uh, they were captured, the organizers were captured by the military at night uh, when they uh, raided uh, their houses. And the general public awareness of the anti-dictatorship, the anti-coup movement is also escalating. But we have to see how much people can bear the brunt of the economic hardship uh, triggered by uh, the, the the current uh, status of the uh, the private sector, which have been which hit hard uh, by the uh, uh, the demonstrations. Right. I need to address exactly what these protesters are fighting for with you, which also means addressing some of your critics. They are fighting against the coup, but many of them are fighting in favor of Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD. But others, even though they're against the military coup. They say they are not for the NLD necessarily returning to power. Um, we'll speak to actually one of your critics shortly, and I need to get your response. I mean, he says the NLD really reaps what it sows because they never actually stood against the military junta. Uh, you worked with them. They say 
the NLD sold out. Uh, you chose to be a collaborator and even sacrifice millions of, of Rohingya lives, for example, uh, in order to get to power and achieve what you now call peace. Is there any truth to that? Yes, Myanmar people uh, uh, still support Aung San Suu Kyi. So we can see uh, supporters are holding her pictures in many parts of the countries. At the same time, uh, there are also uh, sectors uh, in, 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 the, in, uh, in societies, especially from the ethnic minority groups, uh, they feel like they are fighting against the coup, but they are not willing to uh, support uh, the NLD or the uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, because they felt like uh, uh, they did not get a, a similar response uh, from the NLD and, and Do Aung San Suu Kyi. So yes, we do see the two trends, but the majority is still uh, supporting uh, Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Okay. I only have time for one final question, and I need to move this forward with you. Since so much of your experience comes down to sitting at the negotiating table, if the pressure works, both internally and externally, and the military has to go into negotiations, what would you recommend to the generals? I'm, I'm thinking possibly, you know, something like Pinochet uh, in Chile, that style of solution where you would have to offer some sort of amnesty uh, in order for them to, to leave power but be protected for as many atrocities as you accuse them of. Um, at least they would have to step back from power. What do you suggest would work? Would that be an option? Well, the military uh, keeps saying uh, it was the issue with the uh, election irregularities and fraud. So why don't we form an independent commission and investigate those election, uh, uh, allege, uh, those alleged election frauds and you uh, take the results. If the result is Whatever the result coming from the investigation commissions, uh, that should impact on the uh, 2020 elections, and the military agrees to uh, accept the result, then we can move on. This is a win-win situation. We don't have to go through the hardship, and we don't have to go through the bloodshed for the country. Okay, Min Zhao we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. We very much appreciate it. And I'll continue this, this discussion with our guest panel in just a moment, but first... Natalie Pohonen has this report on Myanmar's growing resistance movement, the military's response, and how the international community is reacting. In Yangon, the military has deployed armored vehicles on the streets, a visceral reminder of the power it can wield. Yet it hasn't stopped people denouncing junta rule. CDM stands for Civil Disobedience Movement. Across Myanmar, from cities to townships, ordinary citizens are taking part however they can. These are acts of resistance that in some instances are happening in soldiers' direct line of sight. It's been two weeks since the military seized power and detained the country's civilian leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. But the people are not being cowed. They are trying to threaten the protesters, to stop their activities, to make young people and workers who participate in the CDM scared by showing their armoured vehicles and a lot of soldiers. I was afraid last night. We were thinking they would shoot us, as they did in the past. People are protesting for what they want. It's simple. There are mounting fears about how the army will respond if these demonstrations continue. On Sunday night, security forces opened fire on protesters in the northern city of Mayat Kina. It's unclear if they were using live rounds or rubber bullets. Many people can remember the previous decades of harsh military rule and the brutal crackdowns on peaceful pro-democracy protests of the past, including the 1988 uprising, when the army turned its weapons on civilians killing hundreds. Even with history looming over demonstrators, they're still demanding the restoration of their democratically elected government and the release of Suu Kyi. They're using everything from going on strike, to breakdancing, 
to giving the three finger salute to get their message across. We want to demonstrate that our generation would like to cut off this military dictatorship like the way we cut off these roots in every single way that we can. The military has declared these acts of protest illegal and punishable with jail time. Despite those threats, the pushback inside Myanmar continues, as do the calls for help from the outside. What do we want? We need the UN to protect the country in the good way to protect the democracy also. Democracy, that's all we want. The US government has placed sanctions on current and former military members involved in the coup, cutting off their access to a billion dollars worth of funds held in the US. Other nations are being asked to do the same. I urge other member states to take action from imposing targeted sanctions to bilateral arms embargoes, to ensuring that assistance that they provide to the people of Myanmar goes to civil society organizations directly whenever possible, instead of through the hunter. The military says it took power lawfully and that it will hold elections after a year-long state of emergency. Protesters say that's not an outcome they're prepared to live with. The spectre of violence is once again hanging over Myanmar. The question is, will the international community intervene or will the demonstrators be left to deal with the junta on their own? Natalie Fahunen, The Newsmakers. Here to further our discussion now from Geneva, Wei Nin. She's an officer at Burma Campaign UK. She's also the daughter of detained activist Mia Ai. In London, we have Mong Zarni. He is the co-founder of Forces of Renewal Southeast Asia, a grassroots network of scholars and activists supporting democratic struggles. And completing our panel is Matthew Smith, the co-founder and CEO of Fortify Rights. Thanks all so much with, for being with us. I'm going to start in London. Uh, Mwang Zarni, you reject the military coup, but you also have no time or sympathy for the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, is that to say, then, that there are only unacceptable alternatives at play in Myanmar right now? Well, I think, as a Democrat, I cannot simply write Aung San Suu Kyi or the NLD off. Uh, you know, however, I view them, uh, in particularly in their complicity in the Rohingya genocide. That's an issue that needs to be dealt with uh, through international accountability processes. And I, I will not uh, forgive or condone what they have done. But the military coup is utterly unacceptable. There is no silver lining in any of this as a Democrat, because th this isn't simply about, you know, like shooting people with rubber bullets or like a live round. The, the main outline, the commander-in-chief has brought back, uh, you know, all draconian and new draconian measures. Uh, you know, I lived under the first military uh, dictatorship for 25 years uh, under Nguyen. Now the military has brought back all the, um, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> overnight stay, uh, reporting, and uh, they also introduced the, the Burmese version of Les Majeste uh, that Thailand is so notorious for, uh, you know, the uh, anyone who says anything remotely critical of the military can be jailed for, you know, uh, three years and treason uh, to 20, up to 27 years, and, and uh, in, in addition to curfew and, um, um, you know, other forms of, uh, you know, kidnapping and midnight raids. And so this is all around uh, bad for everybody. Right. But those people on the streets protesting right now, uh, do you feel they're only in support, really, at this point, of the least bad alternative? Not as bad as the military being in charge, but still, you don't think this is what's good for Myanmar, putting the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi back in power? No, I think it, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi are part of the picture. There's absolutely no question that looking at the, uh, the signs and posters, but if you look at the broader... Uh, you know, landscape of the protesters, you will realize that this is actually a Burmese, uh, uh, you know, equivalent of uh, Black Lives Matter. We have a new generation that have never lived under textbook example of a military direct rule. And they are saying, we are not ready to, or we are not prepared to be put back under the boot, uh, you know, where our parents and grandparents grew up. 
And so this this is you know the, this isn't simply choosing between uh, you know lesser of the two evil. The new generation has a different democratic inclusive vision for a Burma intellectually, culturally, ethnically, and religiously. This is very, very different from simply supporting Suchi and NLD. Okay. I mean, there are, maybe we can all accept there is a greater ideal, but what is on the table is what is on the table right now. Uh, so let me put to Wayne in that, you know, maybe the silver lining to this as well right now is that horrible events can actually produce uh, some of the most beautiful moments. I mean, the kind of unity I think we're seeing in Myanmar right now, um, it really is wonderful. We're even hearing suddenly a, a level of sympathy expressed from some Buddhists in Myanmar that they should not have accepted what was happening with, happening with the Rohingya uh, in, in the country as well. What are your hopes then for, for this? Do you, is there at least a sense of unity coming out this, that this coming together in solidarity can indeed stop this military coup from persisting? Well, I hope that this sort of uh, unity that we have seen uh, lasts longer because uh, under the military dictatorship, it doesn't matter uh, about our ethnicity or our religion. We all will suffer. Uh, we all suffer. So uh, solidarity and unity is very important. But if we look in the past of uh, 1988 uprising, uh, the military has a tendency to use the religious nationalist um, sentiments to divide people. So uh, it's a dangerous, uh, you know, um, uh, it's a dangerous thing to think about. And of course, people are. Uh, it's very encouraging to see a lot of young people out there using their creativity and their, uh, um, you know, bravery to protest against the military dictatorship. But also they are asking for is international help and support. And of course, the encouragement from the international community with statements of condemnation is great. But uh, I think uh, we passed the point of issuing statement of condemnation because every day, it's been two weeks now, Mayan Line is using every tool he has to oppress the people of uh, Burma. And uh, he's bringing in every law to oppress freedom of expression in the country. So. Um, I, I, I think monitoring the situation is not enough uh, to go on. Right. It seems that these generals are so accustomed now to being a pariah state. Uh, though civilians may have suffered, they were still able to ensure they think uh, their existence and stability somehow. They're digging in their heels <laughs> harder than ever. You know, why would they succumb to international pressure at this point, especially given they still do have the support of China, which makes the UN Security Council basically renders it useless in this case? Well, when Mei Online uh, decided to state the coup, of course, he completely understand, understands the consequences of the, his action. But if you look at in the past, uh, uh, human rights abuses admitted by the uh, military, the reaction from the international community has been very little. So he is calculating that he can get away with it. And this is exactly what he is calculating now. It's been two weeks and all he is receiving is uh, statements and letters of condemnation. Even uh, last night when there were uh, military trucks and tanks were going around in the uh, country, uh, of course, the embassies around uh, in Yangon, they issue a statement saying they are watching the situation, but we need more than watching the situation. What the military actually care is action. I mean, May Online isn't immune to the international pressure. That's why we need to use a different uh, range of pressure on the military so that uh, we can restore um, democracy or we can move forward to achieve genuine democracy in the country. Right. Matthew, do you think the international community will move toward uh, the pressure that Wayne In is talking about? Or have you been disappointed in their efforts before? Well, we're certainly disappointed in, in uh, the international community's actions uh, or lack thereof in response to this situation. Uh, the Myanmar military junta poses a threat to international peace and security. Uh, it did. It, it's worth noting that it, it posed such a threat uh, before the coup. And that threat is just uh, uh, exacerbated or intensified since the coup. And as you mentioned, the UN Security Council uh, is 
has been um, uh, essentially neutralized uh, by China's threat of a veto. China's only ever actually used its veto once back in 2007. And then months later, uh, there was, of course, blood in the streets, uh, uh, cracking down on, on street protests, nationwide protests then. So we do fear that the situation could get worse. We're already seeing excessive force. We've seen lethal force. We're seeing mass arrests, nighttime raids. Uh, the military junta spreading its fear throughout the country. And we're seeing undeterred people of Myanmar standing up to this. And so right now, the international community needs to stand with them. Uh, and, and what we're proposing uh, at the moment is for a uh, emergency special session at the UN General Assembly. When the UN Security Council fails to do its job to protect uh, against internet threats to international peace and security, there is a resolution that can be used to transfer that um, uh, that role to the UN General Assembly, and we feel like that is urgent and appropriate right now. Uh, you know, Matthew, I have to have you expand on why you actually think Myanmar is this wider security threat to the entire world, because that's what it seems mostly Western powers aren't, aren't exactly sold on right now. They don't. They can easily watch Myanmar become a pariah state again, and it will make little difference to the security. Uh, of the rest of the world. Right. Well, we, you know, we, we've seen mass uh, refugee outflows uh, over the years. The UN Security Council has regarded that in the past as, as the threat to international peace and security. Um, certainly a military coup d'etat, which was carried out by essentially detaining a world leader, um, uh, also would, would uh, constitute and has in the past been regarded as a threat to international peace and security. Genocide, war crimes, other mass atrocity crimes have been perpetrated. So when you combine all of these elements, uh, the, the, the Myanmar military junta essentially checks all of these boxes. So it's, it's not as though it poses a threat in one particular way. There are a myriad uh, ways in which it's posing a threat. Mong Zoni, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, with due respect, uh, Matt, I think, uh, you know, as you and I both know, the uh, staging a military coup or arresting a, you know, a formerly iconic um, human rights leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, do not constitute, um, you know, a crime under any international law. But I, I am in, to, you know, full support of you in terms of the spirit of your statement. The problem is, as you know, you know, the, both the General Assembly and the Security Council have sat on their hands uh, when, you know, close to 900,000 people were genocidally purged and 400 villages were burned down, you know, in a cold-blooded, calculated um, genocidal attack, not just simply ethnic cleansing. Genocide is an you know, international crime. And Burma is a state party to the Genocide Convention. So we've got the International Court of Justice, uh, you know, Gambia versus Myanmar case moving forward. And also the, you know, the international mechanism of a, a criminal responsibility of individual leaders such as May Lai at the International Criminal Court uh, is grinding out, uh, you know, grinding forward. And so there are things that are happening. But I think that the... Uh, at this point, uh, you know, it's difficult to argue, uh, you know, that uh, Myanmar poses a threat to international or regional security because not even Bangladesh is treating the uh, genocidal regime in Burma as a threat to uh, its sovereignty. It's buying 100,000 tons of rice from the country and continue to say, we want to be friends. So we have a situation with the United Nations that has failed to honor its charter obligation. Both of us know that Myanmar, as a sovereign state, has failed to protect its own citizen. This is a classic responsibility to protect case. But the Security Council is in a constant coma, and UN system runs around this 300 years old uh, arcane principle of Westphalian agreement. Do okay. what you want to your populations. As long as trade and goods are flowing, we will leave you alone. Maung Zarni, I'm going to have to give you the last word. So unfortunately, we're out of time. And Wei Nin, I very much apologize for not uh, letting you have a final say there. 
That's the nature of live television. Thanks all so much for joining us, and we'll end today's show with scenes from the past two weeks in Myanmar as citizens across the country push back against military rule. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.